In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much because of reminding us that your grace is sufficient for every one of us. We thank you for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have shown him to us as our Savior. You have shown him to us as our substitute. You have shown him to us as a high priest. You have revealed him to us as a sanctifier. You have shown him to us as a king that reigns on high. You have revealed him as the one that sits on the throne at the right hand of the majesty on high. He has been presented to us as a provider of all things that gives us rest, complete abundant rest. You have shown him to us as the one that stands between us and you, uh, revealing the things of God to, unto us and revealing the requests that we have unto you. You have revealed him as a foundation and a cornerstone, as a mediator of the new covenant as the one that ministers the better promises unto us. Now, through that living and new way, we can enter into the very presence of God. And we pray, O oh Lord, every one of us will discover for ourselves and will appropriate for ourselves all the blessings of the new covenant in Jesus' name. The benefit of the new covenant that will write these laws upon our hearts you will bypass, you will overlook, you will cleanse the way. All our iniquities, all our sins, they will never be remembered against us anymore. Oh Lord, we pray, you fulfill this for everyone in Jesus' name. As we come before you today again, we pray that you reveal your mind, your word, your wisdom, yourself, to every one of us in Jesus' name. Strengthen the feeble-minded. Encourage those who are downtrodden. Lift up those who are falling. We pray that you make a conviction to be stronger in the Lord, even through the study today, in Jesus' name. We pray that you give us the grace to remain faithful to the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we come to Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 19 to verse 39. The apostle has been laying a very strong foundation in the epistle to the Hebrews. In building a house, you need a strong foundation. And the apostle wanted to put in place the cornerstone of the new temple. He wanted to have a strong foundation for the spiritual building. He wanted to plant strong conviction in the heart, in the minds of the people concerning the new covenant. Now that he has done that, he now wants to go to practical things. And so what remains now in the epistle to the Hebrews are very practical, very encouraging, very comforting words. He is already now put behind himself the old covenant. And in particular today, as he launches into this, you will see what he's talking about. He calls it a new and living way. He invites us to enter into the holiest of all. He also pleads with us to be cleansed by the washing of the water. He's telling us that Sinai is put behind us, Zion is put before us, and we should draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He talks about faith, he talks about love, he talks about hope. The three things that are very principal, very essential, very important in the new covenant. He also talks about our assembling together. He reminds us that the final day, the day of reward, the day of rapture, the day of reckoning is fast approaching. And he tells us how to be able to receive from the Lord all the things that we need to receive. And then if you open to chapter 11, which will be for next periods of study, he now launches into faith. He illustrates, he instructs, he invites us to move along with the heroes of faith and become strong in faith. In chapter 12, we're still talking about something very practical. Lifting up Jesus Christ and telling us to look away from everything around us and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In chapter 13, he's talking, calling us to love, he's calling us to purity, he's calling us to everything that we have in the new covenant, and then he ends up with call to perfection. I'm pleading with you to please avail yourself of the privilege of studying the deep, deep, deep wonderful things that we have in the rest of the epistle. I appeal to all our leaders and all our workers to impress it, to influence the members of the church in every district you are coming from, Come along with them. We need to give this period of time. 
these weeks ahead of us and look into chapter 11 which is on the heroes of faith so that all the things we've been complaining about uh, this is happening this is happening which faith will remove which faith will clear away we will all be here and our faith will become stronger in jesus name our passage of today is divided into three parts number one call to devotion and righteousness Number two, the consequence of deliberate rebellion. Number three, continuing steadfastly till rapture and rewards. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 19. As we look at point number one, we are being called to devotion and righteousness. Having therefore, bre having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. You will see that little word in verse 19, therefore. Now that therefore is referring back to everything that we have learned. Old covenant behind us, the new covenant in front of us. Therefore, our God, Father in heaven, spoke unto men in days gone by with the prophets and with the visions and all those dreams and diverse manners. But now he speaks unto us by his only begotten Son. Therefore. Because Jesus Christ is greater than all angels, is greater than all men, is greater than the priests of the Old Testament, is greater than Aaron, is greater than Melchizedek, is greater than Abraham, because of the greatness, because of the height of exaltation of Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Testament, therefore... The sacrifices of the Old Testament could not make all the people that came in the Old Covenant perfect. But now, that final, perfect, effective, efficacious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ has been put in place, therefore. He said now, having therefore, brethren, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It's referring in a little, in a little way to the Old Covenant. In the old covenant, only the high priest could enter into the holiest of all. All the Israelites were not privileged to enter. Because that was the place where the Shekinah glory of God was. Because that was the way place the light was always shining and the fire was always burning. Because that was the way the representation of the mighty God was established and settled. And the high priest will enter into that place, the holiest of all, only once a year. And he entered with fear. Because if he did anything and he will fall down and die. But then the apostle is telling us all that is gone. It is not just for one high priest. And it is not only once in a year. He said, brethren, all the people of God. Now we are not approaching with fear. We are approaching with boldness. And we are able to enter into the holiest. And it is not by the blood of an animal by the blood of jesus every day every moment every time now every believer can enter into the very presence of god i'm not talking of a church building i'm not talking of a prayer house anywhere you are that now becomes the holy ground and the moment you mention the name of jesus and you come through the eff efficacious blood of jesus christ you are right in the presence of the almighty god in verse 20, he said, by a new and living way. He said, it's not the old way, it's the new way. It's not the old way with the sacrifice of animals. It's not the old way with incense and burning. It's not the old way coming through an animal. It is a new way because of the new covenant. And it is a living way. It doesn't bring any death. Because you remember in the Old Testament... The sons of Aaron that entered into the holiest place and they entered with a strange fire, they dropped dead. It was death it ministered to them. It is not the living way. He said it's a new way, it's a living way. And then he tells us which he, Christ, has consecrated for us. We have left Moses, we have come to that one greater than Moses. We have left Aaron, we have come to that one that is greater than Aaron. We have left the sacrifices of the old covenant, we have come to the final, single, unique sacrifice that is final of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, which is consecrated for us. Then he said, through the veil. Now can you see what he's saying? He said, in the old covenant, the, uh, the high priest will pass through the veil. And then when he gets inside, he'll be in the presence of God in the holiest of all. But when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, 
when he offered that final perfect sacrifice, when he shed his blood and consecrated the new way for you and for me, the veil in the temple was wrenched into two from a top unto bottom. He is not thinking, he is not talking about another veil. Through the veil, that is to say his flesh. Which means then when Jesus Christ was pierced and then there was an opening in the body. And at the same time, the veil in the temple was right into two. It means now that sacrifice makes a way for you. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now you can come through Christ, through that veil, and come to the very presence of the Almighty God. And having a high priest over the house of God. The high priest as Jesus Christ. The house of God, the household of faith. The church, the pillar of truth, the family of God. This high priest Jesus Christ is now over this family of God. Uh, what are we now to do? What's the exhortation? What's the invitation? What's the call that is now given unto us? He said, let us draw near. Uh, you see, the apostle is showing us the beauty of the new covenant. It's showing us the glory of the new covenant. Because when the Almighty appeared on Mount Sinai, all the children of Israel, they drew back. They were afraid of that glory. It was so terrible that Moses himself said, I quaked also, I trembled also at that time. He now says, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. Then he says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's the background of the old covenant he's talking about. When all those priests were to come around and they were to enter into the holy place, there was a kind of container. It was called labor of water where they will wash their feet, where they will need to be washed. And then after that washing, they will move on. They will be able to enter. But now he says, it's not the labor there. You are now washed by the word coming from the Lord. That's the water being referred to here now. After being washed by the blood and by the word of God, you believe the word, you believe the blood, now you can enter into the very presence of God. There are many people who are still living in the old covenant era. They don't have confidence to come to the presence of God. They don't have boldness to come to the presence of God. They do not understand grace. They operate in fear. They do not know they themselves as brethren, as children of God, as sons and daughters of the Lord. You can enter in. They feel that another person, a prophet, a priest, a superintendent, a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a prayer warrior, will have to enter for them and they will stay outside. Look, because of the blood of the Lamb and because you can now come with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, you yourself, you can enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Yours is a privilege. There is no blockage. There is no hindrance. There is no barrier between you and the holiest of all. It is not your feeling that, uh, that clears the way. It is the blood of the Lamb. It is not how long you have been in the kingdom that clears the way. It is the blood of the Lamb. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a full heart, with a free heart, with a clean heart, in the full assurance of faith. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 7 and 8. But in the second, when the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. That's talking about what he did in the old covenant. And then in verse 8, it says, The Holy Ghost, thus they signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as yet, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. That is at that time of the old covenant. At that time when the tabernacle of the Old Testament people was still standing. They didn't have the free access into the very presence of God, into the holiest of all. And even the high priest could not just go there anytime he wanted. It was a particular time, a chosen time, a fixed time, only once in a year. But you see the privilege we have now. Every moment and every time. You can literally dwell and abide and live in the very presence of the Lord in the holiest of all. 
because Jesus the door has offered himself for us. In John chapter 10 verse 9. John chapter 10 verse 9. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find a, a pleasure and find a pasture. And then he tells us when we enter, we can now enter with boldness. Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 16. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may find, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whenever you see that little word, therefore, you must always look at what precedes that therefore. Look at it now. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, therefore. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, you know what he's saying here? Satan cannot hinder the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan cannot close the way. Jesus Christ has passed through had pierced the heavens and he had entered into the heavens into the very presence of God on your behalf, on my behalf therefore let us follow on and let us enter in verse 15 for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin therefore you know the point here our entering into the presence of god does not depend on our feeling does not depend on who we are it depends on who he is because of him because of him because of what he has done let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need in uh, hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. He talks of Christ. He talks of what he has done. He talks of the promises of the Lord. He talks of the faithfulness of God. And he said, we have no reason to doubt him. We have no reason to draw back. We have no reason to be feeble. We have no reason to be inconsistent. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. After all, don't you know, he is faithful that promised. Then he says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. He's telling us we're in the family. He had spoken earlier about the house of God. And he says that we're in the family, we do not provoke ourselves to negative feeling, to negative temper, or to negative activity. We provoke ourselves to something positive, unto love, and unto good works. He then tells us how to avoid lukewarmness, how to avoid backsliding, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exalting one another, encouraging one another, speaking to one another, counseling one another, uplifting one another, challenging one another, exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. After he had uh, given all this exhortation to the children of God, as a faithful preacher and pastor, he now brought necessary warning to the people. He said the new and the living way is there, uh, but there is something that is still there as well. There is something that the old covenant did not take away, and the new covenant has not cancelled. It is our free will. As glorious, as gracious, as majestic as the, the, the new covenant is, there is something that may stand in the way, and that is our free will. He therefore now he talks about the will of man. He talks about the desires and the decisions of men. He talks about some deliberate actions of men. This leads us to point number two, deliberate rebellion and its consequence. First of all, I need to remind you here, because you need to know that there are many, many warnings in the scriptures. In fact, in the epistle to the Hebrews, there are a number of warnings. And you need to know that some of the warnings are directed at sinners. Some of the warnings are directed at believers. Some of the warnings are directed at the rebellious. If you are a believer, you are going to bring confusion into your life if you take the warning that is meant for the sinner and you are applying it to yourself. If you are a believer, although perhaps a weak believer, a feeble believer, but you are a believer, you love the Lord, you are a child of God, 
you might even be a trembling believer. You are going to get yourself into confusion and conflict if you take something that is meant for the rebellious and you apply it to yourself. You are going to have unnecessary fear. I told you that there are many warnings in the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Oh, that's a warning. And it's talking to the people who have had the word of salvation. They are rejecting, they are neglecting, they are putting aside, they are belittling the message of salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If you are born again, if you have the joy of salvation, if you have the evidence of salvation, if the joy is bubbling within your heart, praise the Lord, I've given my life to the Lord, I am saved. When you read that, you do not say, oh, I'm neglecting. No, you are not the one being spoken to. This one is warning to the people that are neglecting so great salvation. Chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And you know now, this one is not for sinner. This one is not for an unbeliever. Take heed, brethren. From, from verse 7, he had been talking about the people in the wilderness who came out of Egypt, but they were not able to get to the land of Canaan. Their hearts were drawing back to Egypt. They were remembering the things they ate in Egypt. They were remembering the lifestyle of Egypt. And there was something drawing them, attracting them, enticing them, tempting them to want to look back into Egypt. I said if you are in that condition, that instead of looking straight ahead of you and making up your mind, you want to get to the land of promise, your heart is drawing back. There's something that is pulling you. Take it for such people, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. In chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. He's talking about people again, they are believers. But if they have tendency to unbelief, tendency towards hardening of the heart, he said, let us be afraid, lest that a promise have been left for us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to slightly miss it, come short of it. The point is, there are many warnings in this epistle. Now, this is a warning now that we have in chapter 10. This is for the apostate. This is for the people that are hardened in their backsliding. These are the people that know the truth and deliberately choose error and falsehood. These are the people that even if Jesus appeared to them in a vision, in reality, they'll push him aside, walk over him, and go their selfish, sinful way. Now from chapter 10 verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fairy indignation which shall devour the adversaries. This one is talking about rebellion. This is talking about the people like Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. This is talking about the people that deliberately choose because of their free will. They choose the way of error deliberately after knowing the truth. These are the people that make themselves adversaries of the Lord. In verse 28, he that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment supposed he shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He talked about the same kind of people in chapter 6 of Hebrews, from verse 4 to verse 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the uh, heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and of the past of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is not talking about ordinary backsliders. You remember Peter? He denied the Lord. He sinned against the Lord. He even cursed while denying the Lord. But you know that as he remembered, he wept 
bitterly that he had done such a terrible thing against his law. And the Lord forgave him. The Lord did not say there is no more offering or sacrifice for sin. The Lord did not quote that against him. You will remember David. David sinned. That was backsliding. He came to pray of mercy upon me, O God. He said, in the multitude of your tender mercies, blot away my transgression. He said, I've sinned against you, have I sinned, and I've committed, I've done this evil. He said, I acknowledge my sin, my transgression is always before me. But he said, wash me, and I shall be clean. Cleanse me, I'll be whiter than snow. He said, let the joy of thy salvation come back unto me. The Lord forgave him. Blessed is the man upon whom the Lord will not impute iniquity, or the person whom God covers his sin. The Lord forgave him. But the people that the Bible is talking about here, Look at what the Bible says about them. Number one, they were once enlightened. They heard the gospel. The light of the gospel shone into their heart. That's what you'll find in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4. We have read it. Number two, they are tested of the heavenly gift. They were not strangers to the gift from heaven. They are tested of the goodness of Christ. Number three, they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Those were the good old days for them. When the Holy Ghost came into them. And the Holy Ghost brought the message of heaven. The language of heaven. The power of heaven. The anointing of heaven. The unction of heaven. And they were partakers of the Holy Ghost. Number four. They are tested of the good word of God. Not the threats. Not the warnings. Not the condemnation. The word of grace. The word of love. They are tested of the good word of God. Number five, they are tested of the powers of the world to come. Number six, they were sanctified by the blood of the new covenant. Didn't you see that in chapter 10 verse 29? Of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who are trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified. He has now counted it an unholy thing. He was sanctified before. He was saved before. He had the power, the unction, the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon him before. But now, he has deliberately chosen evil, chosen error. He pushed away the Lord. Once again, let me remind you, it is not talking of ordinary backslider. It is not talking of somebody that may not be in the face now. And that person who is not in the faith now is saying, Oh Lord, can you take me back? Oh Lord, I'm backsliding. Oh Lord, will you have mercy upon me? Oh Lord, will you cleanse me again? Oh Lord, will you get me to the kingdom again? All those people, they have chance. They can come back. If you are there today, you can come in today. But these are posts that the Hebrews are uh, talking about. Number one, they are falling away. Not only falling, that's backsliding. They are falling away. Number two, they have crucified again the Son of God afresh. What does that mean? The same hatred that the people who crucified Jesus Christ, the same hatred they had against Jesus, that same hatred these people now, they have against the Lord. The same attitude, the same uh, level, height of unbelief, those people who crucified Jesus, that same height of unbelief that those people had, these apostates, they have it now. The same hypocrisy that those people had, the same hypocrisy they have now. If they were alive at that time, when Jesus was being crucified, they will join those people and crucify the Lord. Number three, these are the people, the apostates, who have put Christ to an open shame. Hey, let me remind you once again, it's not talking about ordinary backslider. Oh, you remember Peter? When he denied the Lord, he denied him openly because of fear. He said, I do not know this man. But in his heart, he was saying, oh Lord, it's because of fear. I want to serve you, but I am weak. I cannot stand before these people. I'm afraid of what they will say and what they will do to me. And he went back and he wept bitterly. But these apostates putting the Lord Jesus Christ to open shame, they are like the Pharisees. They are like the people that nailed Jesus to the cross openly. They hung him on the cross and they chose those soldiers. Keep watching him. He must die. We want everybody to know he is not the Messiah. He is not the Christ. He is not the Savior. Let everybody know we put him to open shame. The apostates, they do the same thing. And they continue to sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. 
they have counted the holy blood of Jesus as an unclean thing. They have done despite to the spirit of grace. For those apostates who have totally rejected the Lord and they have got to a point of no return, there's going to be terrible judgment upon them. That's why it says in verse 28 he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow punishment, greater punishment, more terrifying punishment, and the more terrible punishment, suppose ye shall leave a thought worthy who becomes an apostate. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Even though I've told you that this passage actually does not apply to ordinary backslider, it applies to the apostate. But you know that before a person can be an apostate, he'll be, first of all be a backslider. And if a person becomes a backslider, little by little, little by little, the heart will be hardening. Little by little, he'll begin to speak against the doctrines of the Bible. Little by little, speaking against the church. Little by little, he'll be questioning, is God even there? Little by little you begin to say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus every time. How about my business? Little by little he'll be going from backsliding to apostasy. Backslider, beware. Because the devil is behind you wanting to push you to a point of no, re of no return where the rebellion becomes so hardened, it hardens your heart and now there's no way to come back. Now that there is still a chance, come back today to the Lord. That's the reason why now the apostle ends this chapter by giving us encouragement. Uh, and he's now encouraging every believer on the necessity of continuing steadfastly until the day of rapture, until the time of reward. In verse 32 he said, but. And now whenever you see that, that means now he wants to change gear. He wants to change the line of thinking. He wants to change the topic he has been talking about. I've been talking about the adamant backsliders. I've been talking about the hardened backsliders. I've been talking about the apostates. I've been talking about the people that are not waiting only for the judgment of God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight, a great fight of afflictions. He wants them to look back when they had the gospel. He wants you and I to look back to the day when God brought us out of darkness. Call to remembrance that glorious day you had the gospel, when you were illuminated. And then, after you were converted, there was affliction, there was persecution, and you endured a great fight of afflictions. He said, call to remembrance what you suffered. Will it be in vain? Call to remembrance how they denied you of your right. Will it be in vain? Call to remembrance the fiery persecution they laid upon you. Your parents rejected you. Your husband or your wife persecuted you. Your place of work, they denied you of your right. May many places they laughed at you and they scorned. Will it be in vain? It's like keep on looking back. Don't look back at it, but look back at the things you endured. In verse 33, partly, whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. When everybody saw you and said, are you the one they are talking about? You've got a new religion? Are you the one they are talking about? You don't hear the world anymore? Are you the one anymore? Your father, your mother does not amount to anything in your sight anymore? Are you the one they are talking about? You have joined new church, new religion, husband is nobody anymore? Are you the one they are talking about, that family idol, family worship, that our forefathers have been worshipping? You, you of all people, you have for forsaken that, and education and religion has turned your head. Are you the one they are talking about? You were made a gazing stalk, a laughing stalk. Partly while ye became companions of them that were so used. He said, remember when you lost accommodation, you were looking for accommodation, and somebody who had been driven out to you was another person you were able to find, and both of you persecuted sisters, both of you persecuted brothers, you were managing somewhere, your parents will not look for you, your people will not look for you, you became a companion of the people that were suffering reproaches and affliction and persecution. Look back, will it be in vain? For ye had compassion of me in my bonds. 
He said, not only that you are persecuted because you believe in Jesus, they said, even you didn't find church to go. You didn't find anybody to go. That uh, fellow who was a member of the Sanhedrin, who could have been a high person in religion of the Jews, and his brain turned, he became mad, and he was preaching something. That's the person you are even to follow, even if you are going to go to church. That's the person you are going to church, and you suffered persecution, not because of your faith alone, but because of the preacher who was preaching to you and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods he said look at what you have suffered are you going to miss the reward are you going to miss the rapture then he said knowing in yourselves that ye have is that he now says look at the future stop looking at the things you suffered look at the things you are going to get that ye have in future in heaven a better and enduring substance he said cast not away therefore your confidence don't let persecution shake you. Don't let it make you cast away your confidence in the Lord, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise, the promise of his coming again, the coming of the better inheritance, the promise in the new covenant, the promise of all the things they have made available for us through the cross of Calvary, the promise of abundant eternal life. He said, for yet a little while, you know when you are suffering persecution, when you are suffering shame, when the people are, re are reviling you, one hour will look like a day. You know when you are suffering pain, when you are going through difficulty, when it appears things are not uh, all right in your life, when it appears friends are forsaking you, when it, when it appears husband is not friendly, wife is not submissive, children are not cooperating, and they are doing all this against you because of your faith. One day will look like a week. One week will look like a month. A month will look like a year. But yet it says, yet a little while. He that shall come will not tarry. He that shall come will come. And Lord is coming. All our tears are going to be wiped away. All the problems will be taken away. He will not tarry. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, if any man draw back, after all that persecution, after all that suffering, after all the denials, after all the shame, after everybody knew you to be a child of God, after you have lost a lot of things because of your faith, if now you will draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You lose the favor of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. The grace of the Lord, the provision of the Lord, the inheritance in heaven, the inheritance that you have as you are in the Lord. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We are not of them that say they are tired, they cannot move on again. We are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We are going to endure till the end. We're going to stand faithful to the end. Whatever fire, whatever indignation, whatever affliction, whatever the devil may be doing, heaven is before us, we are getting there. Are you of those that draw back? I said, are you of those that draw back? Are you of those that draw back? We are part of the people that are moving on. Let hell rise up. Let the demons rise up. Let Satan fight the way he wants to fight. Let the people of the world oppose. Let the persecutors increase their persecution. We are fully persuaded. Not height or death. Not things present and not things to come. Not angels or men. Not Satan or demons. Shall be able to pluck us out of the hand of the Lord. We are not of the people that draw back. I am moving on. We are moving on. We are going to make progress. We are going to submit to the Lord more. We're going to consecrate to the Lord more. We're going to yield to the Lord more. I am not of the people that draw back. I am not of the people that look back. I'm not of the people that surrender to the devil. I'm not of the people that go back to Egypt. I'm not of the what part of the people that perish in the wilderness. I'm going to Canaan. I am going to Canaan. I am going to Canaan. I will get to the city of the king. I will get to the better country. My name is there already. My Savior is there already. My inheritance is there already. My heart is there already. My joy is there already. My inheritance is there already. My desires are there already. I want nothing in Egypt. 
I want nothing in Babylon. I want nothing in the world. I am going unto that glorious place. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. The Lord is waiting for you there. He is waiting at the gate. He wants to open the door for you. He wants to welcome you in. Are you of the people that draw back? Are you of the people that draw back? Are you of the people that draw back? We are not of the people that draw back unto perdition. We are of those that move on unto the saving and the security of the soul. Move on, brother, don't be tired. Move on, sister, don't be tired. A little while, a little while, a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Let him meet you faithful, holding on to the very end. 